This is the first of a whole series of lectures on English intonation. You have a handout. The idea in the handout, really, is that at leisure, you can read the handout and review it. What I say won't necessarily be exactly what's in the handout, and it won't be necessarily in that order. So I suggest you have the handout ready, but don't expect to follow the talk point by point through the handout. Ah, you need a copy of a handout. Has anyone got spare handouts? Yes, here is, here is one, and here's another. As you gathered, some of your lectures are about vowels and consonants, the sounds of speech, others are about intonation. Half of our time is devoted to intonation. Half of the lectures, half of the classes. In this lecture, I'm just going to introduce the general topic of intonation and some basic terminology and ideas. The main topics I'm going to be introducing here in alphabetical order, or more or less alphabetical order, not in the order of appearance anyway. We have accent, which is a technical term, accent in the sense of prominence in intonation. There are two senses of the word accent. One refers to a variety of pronunciation, as when we say a British accent or an American accent. That's completely separate, of course. Another technical term is the intonational phrase, IP. I'll be defining and illustrating that. I need to introduce you to the concept of pitch. Think about pitch. We'll have a first look at rhythm. Also the term stress. This is a technical term as well, not the same as accent. It has a special meaning in the way we use it. Strong and weak syllables. And this lovely word suprasegmental. Suprasegmental. Well, intonation along with rhythm and stress. These are all examples of supra-segmentals or supra-segmental features. Speech. Speech is not just vowels and consonants. It isn't just sounds in a string. We have this nice word segment. Again, it's a technical term. It means a vowel or a consonant. One of the sounds which compose spoken language. So we might say of somebody, oh, his segments are great, but his intonation is terrible. This means he has really good vowels and consonants. They're exactly how we would like them, but the intonation isn't right. We have very good reason to believe, by the way, and increasing evidence, that in order to be a really effective and intelligible speaker of English, you have to have a segmental performance and an intonation performance which match. It's only when the two are good together and are at the same level that you get the maximum benefit out of either of them. So it's no good saying to yourself, oh, I can't do intonation, but I'll become double good at vowels and consonants and that will make up for it, because it won't. <laughs> Beyond a certain point, you can't improve your pronunciation without improving both the vowels and consonants and the intonation together. And in fact, when you really think about it, who says they're really different? It's just something artificial that we're putting on speech. We're saying it's, it's sound and it's intonation, but that's something we've decided to distinguish. Segments of vowels and consonants, and you've got a list of symbols for writing them. On top of the vowels and consonants, and spanning, going over a whole number of speech sounds, or a number of syllables, 
And that's another term I have to illustrate. We have features that run for a long time, or a longer time. And they're called suprasegmental, or prosodic, features. And this uses the Latin word supra, which means beyond. So they're beyond segments, they're above segments. The main things that we can control and listen to, the main things that we attend to are loudness, and the length of sounds and syllables, and pitch. Now, I probably, probably don't need to tell you too much about loudness. In fact, loudness is not really all that important in speech. People tend to think, oh, when you stress a syllable, you make it loud. Well, you do to some extent but the loudness is really not so important. The duration of sounds, the length given to sounds, is much more significant. Sounds can be short, they can be long. We can measure the duration. As you'll see many times in my lectures, and as you'll hear from Mark Huckdale tomorrow, nowadays it's easy to put speech into your computer and measure the duration of it. But length also, I probably don't need to say too much about. It's obvious sounds can be shorter or longer. The third thing is pitch. And pitch is the most important of these properties, and I need to say something about pitch. <coughs> pitch is a property, a perceptual property or dimension that we can uh, sense, which we feel, Perceive, and it seems to go from high down to low. Everybody agrees that ah is high pitched and ah is low pitched. And when we hear speech, the pitch is varying. We doing we're doing things with the pitch. As listeners, we are very sensitive to pitch. We can hear tiny changes in pitch. We attach great importance to them. Now, some of you will be musicians. The others, like me, will be the opposite of musicians, whatever that is, unmusicians. <laughs> you may feel you're no good with pitch. You can't hear pitch. I don't want to hear anybody saying, I am tone deaf. There is no such thing. <laughs> I have never met anybody, I have never met a single student who couldn't learn about intonation if he or she was taught properly. And the one thing you shouldn't be is afraid of pitch variations. You can do it because you can all talk. Because you can talk, you can hear pitch and you can control pitch. And all you have to do is make that a bit more conscious. Pitch, then, is a perceptual dimension which goes from high to low. We've all got this idea that Everybody has a voice with a certain range. We can tell that a certain note is high for that speaker or low for that speaker, disregarding the differences between speakers. Yes, we know that women have higher pitched voices on average than men do. Children have even higher pitched voices. But we can still listen to them and say, oh, that's a high pitch for that person. That's a low pitch for that person. If a child makes a changing pitch, then an adult can copy it, and what we're copying is not the exact pitch, not the exact pitch on the, on the piano keyboard, but the, the position of that pitch in the speaker's overall range. We represent pitch in various ways. One thing you'll see many times in the intonation lectures is this display at the bottom here, which is called an interlinear representation. Interlinear just means in between two lines. It's got two lines, a bit like the stave in music, and on that stave there are various dots. The dots, as I'll explain, represent syllables. Syllables. So you see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dots, which is the same as saying there are eleven syllables in this utterance. And the position of the dot 
between the two lines tells us what the pitch is. So, presented with that, we can perform it. We notice the first dot is low. That means something like I, I. The second dot is high, so that's don't, I, don't, or bom. And then it's got to stay pretty much on the same pitch if this is right. So it's got to be, don't remember his staying on the same pitch. <laughs> then we come to one which is swooping down, and you see it's going, tell. Tell. Mm. Even musicians are sometimes not very good at hearing those rapid sliding pitches. It starts high, but quickly goes low. Tell. And then, by the next syllable, we're very low. So the last four syllables have got to go, the phone number. <laughs> now, if we do all that, we get, I don't remember his telephone number. I don't remember his telephone number. The crucial thing to get hold of is, it doesn't matter what the words are. It doesn't matter what the syllables are. This has nothing to do with the meaning of the sentence. You could replace the syllables with anything, for example, la, and say, la 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 la. Some people find it very easy to do that, others find it difficult, but it's worth practicing. It's worth practicing so that you can dissociate the tune from the specific meaning. The physical thing that is varying to give us pitch variation is fundamental frequency of the voice. The fundamental frequency is the rate at which your vocal folds are vibrating. And we can measure it in hertz. Hertz is the unit of frequency. And here's a curve. It isn't actually the curve of me saying, I don't remember his telephone number. It's the curve of me saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, humming the tune that belongs on, I don't remember his telephone number. Why? Because when you say, I don't remember his telephone number, my voice is switching on and off all the time, and the curve is all broken up, and I wanted to show you a nice smooth curve. But here you see a shape which is pretty much like the one I've drawn with the dots. It starts low, around 100 hertz. It rises to about 160 or 170 hertz. Towards the end, there's a little peak. And then it comes down to a low pitch. In fact, it's not completely low. It's tailing off lower and lower. That is the physical reality behind the dots that I had on the previous slide. For everything that we hear and represent, we can in principle measure it and we'll get a curve like this. You can measure them yourself. There's plenty of free software around. From our department's homepage, you can download a little program called WASP, for example. Speak into your computer with a microphone and you can plot your own fundamental frequency curves like this. This doesn't mean you shouldn't make your ears do the job as well. You need to learn how to do it with your ears as well as with your computer. I said it didn't matter what the words were. The same words can be said in lots of different ways. In the top, we have the one I've just been performing. I don't remember his telephone number. What about the second one? That's different. Instead of staying on the same level after don't, it does something else. And instead of coming down and staying down, at the end it's going up. Spend just a few seconds trying this second one to yourself. See if you can sing it to yourself and figure out what it would sound like. Or even better, <coughs> Sing it to your neighbor. You better introduce yourself <laughs> to your neighbor if you haven't already met. Um, and see if you can agree on what it would sound like. Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs>
Oi! It's... It's my turn again. Now, it's, it starts off in the same way, so I is low. I. Now, don't re is on a high pitch as before, but now we've got to step down a little bit. So instead of don't remember his, we've got to have don't remember his. Yes. And then, no, <laughs> not, not telephone number, because the first syllable of telephone is now very low. Te and the other ones are going, telephone number. <laughs> so, we put it all together, we get, I don't remember his telephone number. Okay, and then if you say it, if you say it fluently, it actually sounds like English. I don't remember his telephone number, but I do remember his email address, something like that. Now, what about these dots? What do the dots represent? I said each dot is a syllable, but you notice that some of the dots are big and some are little. What is a syllable? Well, in very rough terms, a syllable actually is extremely hard to define, but in very rough terms, a syllable is like one unit of speech, one pulse of speech. And if we choose the right utterance and have a look at it, we can see the syllables. Here I took a well-known tongue twister, which is Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. I spoke it into the microphone and I analyzed it. I just plotted the waveform. This is the work of a few seconds on any computer. And let's see. You see at the top, the waveform from the microphone, sometimes it's big and sometimes it's little. How many times are there kind of pulses in the top? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. How many syllables in Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper? Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. 12 syllables and 12 bursts of activity on the waveform, there is one pulse of energy for each syllable. That's because in each of the syllables there's a vowel, and vowel sounds have lots of energy, consonants have very little energy. In this example, I chose a phrase with very quiet consonants, so the waveform would be very <coughs> easy to understand. So basically, a syllable is one of these bursts of energy, a pulse of speaking activity. But you can also see that they're very dissimilar. Some of them are long, some are short, some are big, some are a bit smaller. This is because in English, syllables are very unequal. We have syllables, but they're not all alike. They're, they're very different. Some are big and obvious and loud, and some are quiet and little. In fact, I think the first impression, anybody hearing English, imagine somebody who's hearing English for the first time, what sort of a language is it? Oh, it's these syllables, they're, they're all different. Some are big, some are little. It's fluctuating in energy all the time. Now, we have to know something about how to classify syllables. But basically, basically, the first, as a first approximation, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. There are some big syllables and there are some little syllables in this thing. It's obvious that the first syllable of Peter is more energetic than the second syllable. It's obvious that the syllable picked is more, is more energetic than the syllable uh, picked. Uh, yeah. Now, I'm going to show you a a frightening looking diagram. This is my scheme of types of syllable in English. It isn't just that we have big syllables and little ones, we have all kinds of grades of syllables. To be quite plain, this isn't like a syntax tree, it isn't a sentence, it's a classification 
of kinds of syllable. So syllables may be either full or strong. Alternatively, they can be reduced or weak. How do we know that? Well, a syllable is weak if it's got in it a weak vowel. The weak vowels are schwa and the happy vowel and the weak u vowel. And syllabic consonants, which you'll learn about soon, are also weak. Syllables strong if it's got any other kind of vowel in it at all. So that's the first choice. Has it got a weak vowel or a strong vowel? That's just a question of what segments it contains. If we look at Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper, we can classify the syllables in this way. So the word Peter contains a strong syllable and a weak syllable. So does Piper. Picked is just a strong syllable. But the, the article er uh, is just a weak syllable because it contains the vowel schwa. And the second syllable of pickled, whether you say pickled with a schwa or pickled with a syllabic L, that is weak too. <coughs> now, one of the things that unequal syllables can be observed to do is to mark rhythms. English can be very rhythmic. We can find very rhythmic examples <coughs> of English. A common uh, example is simple verse, nursery rhymes, simple poems. And this is a limerick, a particular kind of silly poem with an obvious rhythm. If I read it, it says, there was a young man of Devizes. Devizes is a town in Britain. There was a young man of Devizes whose ears were different sizes. One was so small it was no use at all, but the other won several prizes. Yeah. Now, on top of the orthography here, you'll see I've marked little accents which tell you where there seem to be beats in the rhythm. I wonder if you can feel that there's a kind of rhythm running through that. There was a young man of devices whose ears were different sizes. In fact, native speakers, and maybe really advanced learners, can hear another beat in the silence between the lines. There was a young man of devices whose ears were different sizes. This is another beat in the gap between the lines because it's going on like a drum as the limerick is spoken. Now, the difference between strong and weak isn't enough to make this rhythm. In order for a syllable to count as a beat in the rhythm, it has to be stressed, what we call stressed. And this is a division which can be applied to strong syllables only. If a syllable is strong, it may additionally be stressed. And by stressed, I mean it carries a beat in the rhythm. As you listen to it, you feel a pulse. The native speaker, if asked to move, his or her hand or foot will do a, a movement in time with the stressed syllable. So as we define it, or as I define it, stress is largely a matter of rhythm. It's the location of a beat. When we hear a whole sentence, we can hear stresses in it. I don't remember his telephone number. You can see, as I say it like that, I'm moving my hand four times, tapping four times. It's got four stresses. I don't remember his telephone number. And the syllables which are stressed are marked with big dots in my example. So the big dot means it's stressed, that is, it's got a rhythm beat on it, the little dot means it's not stressed. <coughs> Here they are. There's one on don't. There's one on remember. Notice it's on the middle syllable of remember because that's where that word is stressed. The first syllable of telephone and the first syllable of number. I don't remember his telephone. Now, 
Now, actually, I've mentioned quite a few of the terms I said I was going to cover already. I've, I've introduced you to pitch. I've just been talking about rhythm. I've mentioned strong and weak syllables. I explained what supersegmental is. Now we come on to the topic of accent. If we go back to my example, I don't remember his telephone number. We want to say that there is an accent on don't. I don't, don't isn't just stressed. It has something else about it that I'm going to call accent. I don't remember his telephone number. Another of the stresses also has this extra something called accent, and that's the one at the beginning of telephone. Not all of the stresses are accents. Not all of the syllables are strong. Not all of the strong syllables are stressed. And not all of the stresses are accents. This is why we need to classify things in this way. I don't remember his telephone number. Now, what marks the accents out from the stressed syllables is something to do with pitch. Can you hear how on don't suddenly we're on a high pitch, and on tell, we've got a change in pitch. The thing that marks those two syllables as having something extra over and above stress is a pitch movement. Remember the fundamental frequency curve, the accents are where there's a big change in the pitch, big change in the fundamental frequency. Where there's no big change, we don't hear an accent. We can still hear a stress, but we don't hear an accent. So, accented versus unaccented is a subdivision of stressed syllables. What is a further division? The accents may be nuclear or pre-nuclear. It's nuclear if it's the last accent in a phrase. Let me give you an example. Here's the other version of I don't remember his telephone number. It's got four stresses, the big knots. This version has three accents because there are three places where the pitch changes. I don't remember his telephone number. Because the pitch is different on each of those three syllables, each of them is marked as accent. The last accent is what we call the nuclear accent, and the others are pre-nuclear accents. Why is this important? Because the pitch treatment, what you do with the pitch on the nuclear accent, tends to uh, control the interpretation of the whole phrase. We have a special number of ways of doing the nuclear accent. We have a limited number of choices. And the overall impression of the intonation of the phrase depends on what you do with that last accent. You have a lot of freedom about what to do with the pre-nuclear accents. A nuclear accent makes a big difference to the meaning and the interpretation. The first accent all, we often call the onset. The last accent is the nucleus. I mention this because sometimes people have the idea that they can find the nucleus by listening to a phrase and picking the biggest accent. They think, oh, I can pick out the nucleus. I just notice it. In fact, if you do it that way, you will often make a mistake because the onset, the first accent in a phrase, is commonly much more obvious than the nucleus. As you will see, you have to figure out what the nucleus is by being a bit more subtle in your analysis. You have to listen to the whole phrase, figure out what the whole pattern is, and then identify the nucleus. I've been talking about phrases. Um, it's not difficult to understand. The phrase has a number of components. The nucleus is one syllable. The head is a string of syllables beginning with the onset at a variable length. Everything after the nucleus is called the tail. 
and anything in front is the pre -pod. We'll be seeing pictures like that many times over the next few days, and that will be revisited. The intonational phrase is a complete intonation pattern terminating with a nucleus. A complete phrase terminating with a nucleus and possibly separated from the next IP by a pause. When we pause in speech, we pause between intonational phrases. That is if we pause fluently. The division of speech into phrases is called tonality. Division into IPs. I'm going to use IP to mean intonational phrase. We can find utterances which mean different things according to the way they're divided. So, John appeared, drunk, means John arrived and he was drunk. But John appeared drunk means John seemed to be drunk. Okay? Different meanings. John appeared, one phrase. Drunk, two phrases. Appeared just means arrived on the scene, turned up. Whereas a single phrase, John appeared drunk, means uh, he seemed to be drunk. He had the appearance of being drunk. Here's a separate exchange. Yogurt, there's chocolate and vanilla means you can either have chocolate yogurt or vanilla yogurt. Or, there's chocolate and vanilla. That means it's mixed up. The yogurt is chocolate and vanilla together. For the most part, the division into phrases is very intuitive. It's not something that causes a great deal of difficulty, I think, because all languages have something like this. In each phrase, there is a nucleus, and I'm now underlining the nucleuses. John appeared, drunk. John is the nucleus in that phrase. Drunk is the nucleus in its phrase. John appeared, drunk, being just one phrase, has just one nucleus. So you can count the phrases by counting the nuclei. Here's a real example of division of phrases. I took this photograph at my local tube station. There's a bus waiting outside and here is a hoarding which is trying to promote cycling, trying to persuade people to go by bike. And can you see if I zoom in on that sign, it says, extend your life, cycle. But it's a joke. It's a joke because we have in English a word, life cycle. Life cycle, the stages in the life of some creature. So to extend your life cycle would be to live longer, or do more things. <coughs> you see that the joke depends on division into phrases. If we have two phrases, extend your life cycle, then for two phrases and two nuclei, but extend your life cycle is an uninterrupted phrase and it has just a single nucleus on the compound life cycle. How does that appear in terms of pitch? Well, if I sketch the pitch, the first one has two falling pitches. Extend your life cycle. Whereas the second one, extend your life cycle. Again, there are the same number of nuclear syllables as there are three. <clears throat> well, I'm coming to the end of my material for this morning. Before I just finally say goodbye, do you have any questions about what I've covered? Yes. about accent. Is an accented syllable a stressed syllable 
with something else, for example, the beginning of a step, yes. The pitch difference that makes a syllable accented can be a sudden change to a high pitch, or a change in pitch, or a sudden movement in pitch. It's something that makes that syllable stand out from the general pitch pattern of the surrounding syllables. Yeah. If, if you had a level stretch of pitch, then there can't really be any accents in it except at the beginning because there's no change in the pitch. If you speak anything on a monotone, whether high or low, all the accents disappear. So if I experiment with speaking on a monotone and say something like, well, I'm almost at the end of my lecture, <laughs> uh, it's the same pitch over and over again. So as I've defined it, there are no accents. There are still stresses, as you can feel, but there are no accents. And before, before we stop, let me see if the little microphone I should have passed to you is working, because it's important that everyone else hears the questions. And, uh, <laughs> just say hello. <laughs> hello. Oh, good, right. So if you want to ask a question, there is a microphone. <laughs> you have another one? Oh. Yes. Uh, you say that. Take the microphone. <laughs> okay. That strong syllables can be stressed and unstressed. And uh, could you give an example of an unstressed but strong syllable? An unstressed but strong syllable. Sure. Yes. Uh, there are examples of this in tomorrow's lecture, but for instance, uh, if I take the word fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> this word fantastic is stressed on the second syllable. The first syllable is not stressed, but it contains the strong vowel a. Ah. Fantastic. Notice you can't say fantastic, as many learners of English do. You can't automatically weaken it to a schwa. English definitely maintains the contrast between strong and weak vowels in unstressed syllables. This is a peculiarity of English. Quite a lot of languages have weakening processes where vowels change according to the stress on the syllable. English has strong weak vowels, but they're not completely linked to whether the syllable is stressed or not. You can still have a strong vowel in an unstressed syllable. Is it the same as tertiary stress? Is it the same as tertiary stress? Well, um, Tertiary stress is quite a step because we haven't even mentioned secondary okay. stress yet. But uh, okay. <laughs> if, if I tell you my own, my own opinion is there is no such thing as secondary stress or tertiary stress. Uh, there's just stress. Stress is a beat in the rhythm. All the other differences have to do with pitch. They're to do with accent. So when we say that a syllable is secondarily stressed or has a tertiary stress, what we mean is it has a rhythmic beat, but it, it's less likely to be the location of an accent. There's lots more examples like this tomorrow, so maybe I can clarify this some more then. Any further questions? Okay, so here's thank you.